thank you for coming. Uh, thanks for the intro. Um, so um, today, I mean, we've had some great talks all around resilience. And um, so today I wanted to uh, bring uh, to this session how we went through the rebranding process and not on the high street. Um, the brand has been established for 17 years now. Uh, and uh, when we came into the market, we came as a disruptor. Uh, we were a digital platform uh, that brought thousands of small creative businesses and all of their items to millions of customers. And in this new, uh, busy, crowded market uh, post-COVID, uh, our brand uh, experienced uh, quite a few challenges. And so we went through a, a process of uh, reviewing our customer base, really trying to understand um, what customers really wanted and uh, went through the rebrand back in September 2022. I'm going to use the rebrand as our main narrative, but in terms of today, this is more about the process that we went through, how we try to really understand at their core our customers, the missions, the pains and gains, and how we've sort of recreated our customer value proposition, our brand, and how we've evolved over time. Uh, because the rebrand was not just at one point in time, just changing everything, the experience, the look and feel, the tone of voice, but it's also a journey uh, which we're on and we're uh, continuing on that. But just for the ones that may not have come across our brand before, um, I'm just going to take a couple of minutes to uh, explain who we're all about. Um, so we are a gifting uh, marketplace. And like I said, we've been around for quite some time. We've focused on the UK market and we've got over 5,000 uh, small creative businesses that are on our platform. And we give them uh, essentially that platform for them to uh, market to uh, millions of customers across the UK. In terms of what you can find on our website, uh, everything that uh, you can see has been baked, designed, or created by all of the artisans, designers, and curators that are part of our platform. And uh, we can find lots of unique, very interesting items. And some of the things that we've been very popular for over the years has been around the personalization and customization of the items that you can find. But as I mentioned, uh, we've had some challenges. Our brand hasn't changed very much over the year, our experience either. And uh, we arrived at a time post-COVID where whilst we had lots of great tailwinds and nearly doubled the size of our active customer base, uh, we found that we had some key challenges that needed to be addressed. The first one being that we had an aging customer base. So our typical customer would be an ABC1 female over the age of 35, but we really struggled to sort of tap into those younger audiences. The second, was around the COVID cohorts. Uh, at the time when we went into lockdown, a lot of brands were not able to fulfill orders. And that's the, at that stage, our small creative businesses were in a very strong position, didn't have all the warehouses, uh, situations, etc. So we were able to really tap into those opportunity. But once the world reopened, we really struggled to keep those customers engaged. They came to us uh, because there was a gap in the market at that time, and it was a really struggle for us to really bring them back in and stay with us. And I guess the final one, um, everybody knows we've been talking about it a lot today, uh, the economic backdrop. Um, the, co the cost of living crisis has been really tough on everybody, but in retail in particular, gifting has been the one that's been hit the most with double digit uh, uh, negative growth year on year, uh, which clearly has been, has been really tough. So for us, it was really around really thinking about how we were going to reimagine the brand, the experience, how we were going to bring customers uh, to our platform. But it was also around how we were going to take the entire business and all of our partners on that journey. Because it was very important for us to be very structured. And it really all started with how, do we, how well do we understand uh, our customer and their mission. So we, it all started with us invested in market research, but also leveraging our product and UX team to, do, to run a lot of research with our existing customers. And uh, for us to really identify the emotional, social, and functional jobs that the customer were on in terms of their gifting missions, and really understanding the pains and gains that they were expense, exp um, experiencing throughout that journey. 
once we collected all that information, and we did have a lot, it was really important for us to cluster it and make sense of it. So really understanding what was the frequency of those pains and gains, and really thinking about what are the ones that we can really tackle as a brand, and what would make sense for us as well. So we prioritized those clusters, and we also aligned them with the attitudinal segments that we were already targeting. So it was also important for us to understand our current core audience and some of the audiences that we're going after and really tackling those pains and gains in line with that. Once we had all the pains and gains, it was all around thinking about what would be our tactic? What would be the unique play of the brand that we would put together that would construct our customer value proposition? And once we had that, value, that customer value proposition, this is what essentially underpin our entire business plan and when we started to go on that road of the rebranding, we are using all of this customer's data. So in terms of the, the customer research and what it told us and where that led us on our journey, we were very focused on gifting and we saw that there was definitely an opportunity for us to think about gifting but also self-treating because a lot of customers actually came to our site to buy things for themselves. So it was quite important to really tap into that gifting but also tapping into that sort of lifestyle at the same time. In terms of the gifting market, that's still a big market, it's over 11 billion pounds in the UK. So, and we represent today a very small part. Uh, we own a very small part of that market. So still a big opportunity, but it was very important for us to also think about the customer frequency and how we were gonna keep customers engaged outside of those big four uh, gifting, uh, gifting events throughout the year. We are a very, very seasonal business, so we see very high peak during Valentine's Day, Mother's Day, Father's Day, and Christmas, of course. But it was very important for us to think throughout the year. Broadening our audience, we talked about the challenge of the aging audience. And it was really around us thinking, how are we going to tap into those younger audience? And that's not just about the marketing and you know, how we're going to look and how cool our tone of voice is going to be uh, and how great our photography is. It was also about the experience on the site and the expectations of a more, uh, of a more younger audience and how more tech savvy they are, but also thinking about our range as well. So the rebrand was not just a marketing exercise, it was an exercise where we had a huge amount of matrix team across the business that were working together, each of them with a very clearly defined role. And of course, I've mentioned it already, but really trying to uh, continue to double down on the big four, but really thinking about how do we leverage frequency and, and start to diversify a little bit further into that self-gifting. And to give us the best chance possible, it was important to also understand some of the barriers to purchase that we were challenged with uh, at the time. Value for money, and especially in this cost of living crisis, it was really uh, important for us to really understand the source of it. Of course, people go to a site and really want to make sure that what they're buying is worth it, but it's not just about the item, it's also the experience that they have, and especially in gifting, is also the experience that the giftee is gonna get from what, the, from what they've purchased. Convenience, I mean, we're in a world where Amazon is dominating when it comes to, co to uh, convenience, and it's true that for us, we didn't necessarily update as much all, um, all of our delivery option. And it was really important for us to rethink that and see how, um, how in line we were with uh, the expectation of the customer today, especially in that broader audience. Inspiration. A lot of, our, uh, a lot of the information that came through our research showcased that a lot of people came to our marketplace to gain inspiration in gifting, yet we were not necessarily able to close the deal and they will go on to buy somewhere else. So it was really important for us to reconsider, do we need to diversify further our range? Do we need to really improve our site search so then people can really find those things? And really thinking also about our content strategy and how we're thinking about diversifying our content and not necessarily just being purely commercial, but really driving that inspiration and a mix of both of them and of course the excitement and enjoyment so that is really throughout the experience and really even thinking about that post purchase so when we had all of this information um, we, we've always had attitudinal segment uh, since I've ever joined the business five years ago 
But the way we used them in the past was very much used by the brand team in particular and not necessarily widely across the business. And that's one of the things that we really changed, um, the way we were approaching it and the way we were talking about them throughout the business. The reason why attitudinal segmentation is important is because it's going to really direct you in terms of where are you going to talk to, our, to, our, to your customer, really speaking to them at the right time in the right places, but also guide you in terms of where you make, you're making marketing efficiencies, where you're going to invest your pounds, but also thinking about um, our commercial team, our product team, and our UX teams as well. So when we, we re-evaluated our attitudinal segment, we found eight segments. Uh, but we just didn't really want to spread ourselves too thin. So we decided to focus on three core segments, which essentially made the vast majority of our core base today. So we had the planners or the planned. Um, so those are the ones, uh, maybe some of you in the audience will be, uh, will be the ones who always have the birthdays in their calendar. They're always well ahead. Uh, they know when to buy. Um, very birthday focused, but also, of course, purchasing for the top four. Uh, but very focused on that element of showcasing how well you know the person that you're gifting for. So the personalization and the uniqueness of the item was really key. And that really sort of helped us understand how we customizing our content to those customers, but also how we're thinking of our range in general. And those customers were always having a very set price. So again, thinking about how we marketing to those customers and how we showcasing our range was really key. Then we had the spontaneous. So those are the people that will just buy for any occasion to say thank you, to say well done, to say sorry you got dumped. Any, uh, any of those sort of things. And so um, it's really buying based, based on the mood. So for us, it was very key to understand um, how can we keep those customers engaged. And it was all about newness, really showcasing them what is new, what new partners have we brought, brought on the platform, why is this item so interesting, and why should you buy it? Those customers have flexible budgets, so I guess for us it was more around um, how we're really bringing that uniqueness and, uh, and uh, newness out in our content. And finally, the thoughtful. So those are the ones that are really considered. So they will take ages to really make a decision, and uh, they buy for their close families and their friends, and uh, all the significant events again. So a little bit of a mix of the spontaneous and the plan. But they're also buying big things, so big price items. So really thinking about, again, how we will be uh, communicating to those guys. In addition to our attitudinal segment, I mean, we've talked a lot about retention today. Uh, we reevaluated our segmentation and took a slightly different approach. So today, what I'm showing you is uh, the in-life segments, but uh, we also have an early life segment. So if you're thinking about from the first purchase onwards, uh, what we saw in our data is that the first 90 days when a customer has made their first purchase is absolutely crucial. If we manage to get that second purchase within 90 days, the propensity of that customer making a purchase and become one of those creme de la creme super fan is much, much greater. So this is why we created in uh, early life segments to begin with and sort of treating them slightly differently. Reason being is what they will see on the site, what sort of product we, should, we will show to them, but also what does the onboarding would look like when it comes to CRM and channel choices. Then once they're past those 90 days, they will fall within some of, uh, one of those four buckets. There are many ways of doing segmentation, and I don't think there is a right or wrong way, but what's important is that this is not something that you do and you just leave on the side uh, and not use it. For us, there were some key elements for us to tackle when it comes to the segmentation. First of all, the fact that we will be able to talk about it throughout the business and people will understand it, will understand who are those groups, what type, what, what type of behavior do they showcasing, and really making it easy for people to digest, but also understand what type of action am I going to take uh, out of that. It doesn't have to be super complicated. I mean, we've got a small insights team, and they've built that within about 
four to six weeks. And that was after lots of back and forth with our retention team, but also gathering a little bit of feedback from our product UX as well as commercial team, because it was very important to make sure that something that um, everybody adopts and not just the marketing team. So in terms of how we've approached it, so on the left hand side, we created a customer likelihood to buy, uh, relatively simple again, uh, that the team put together and looking at the length of customer relationship over time. So we've got four main buckets and those are really aimed at how we're going to talk about it throughout the business, how we're going to review the performance of those buckets. But when it comes to the marketing itself or purely about the email marketing, etc., we will create some further micro segments to really tackle some of those behavior. So on the left hand side, you've got the transactional. So those are the guys that are coming from a third party. So a typical journey would be people searching on Google for uh, brace, uh, personalized bracelets. They will find it on Google Shopping. They will land on a product page. They will purchase and leave no engagement whatsoever with the brand. They would not have had the opportunity to really browse through the site, to understand who we are, what we're all about, why they should come back to us. So those are the ones we really need to engage with the brand and really think about where they are, how do, we, how do we communicate to them, and how do we actually showcase the value, the depth of the brand, and why they should come back. Then we've got the occasionals. So they've purchased a little bit more, they're a little bit better than the transactional, but they are just the occasional shoppers. So they are the one with like the opportunity, the opportunity to become those super fans. So it's really about encouraging them with the right nudges and the value exchange, what it is that we can bring to them and what they should go to us instead of a competitor. Then the creme de la creme, like I said, the super fans. So those are the ones that have been with us for a long time. And some of those customers here have been shopping with us for over a decade. So they are super important. Sometimes they may shop five, five times a year plus. So these are the ones that we absolutely at all costs keep with us. So it's really around recognizing uh, how long they've been with us, what they've been shopping, but also rewarding their loyalty. And finally, the forgotten friends. So those are the ones that are at risk of lapsing. Uh, so they could have been occasionals or super fan at some stage, but they started to become disengaged and the relationship has lost its depth. So it's really around re-exciting them with valuable services. So I think that, that was quite a massive step change for us because I think now if we go into any meeting and we will be talking about the occasionals or the super fans, everybody around the business knows what it is. And I think that's the massive difference that we had before with the, the um, retention segmentation that we had before and what we have today. I think the point here is really around how to bring the entire business on a journey and not just purely the marketing department. So once we've done all that work, which uh, took a few months, um, it was very important to define the goals of the rebrand and what it is that, uh, what were the challenges and really making it clear to the entire business and what it is that we needed to do. We had the challenge of awareness as a brand, relevance, value, and consideration. So what it is that we need to do across all of those. So in terms of awareness, it was around connecting with our audience and really stand out of the crowd. And the brand will have a role with that, but also the experience that you will get on the site and the range that you will get. So as part of that, we also made a lot of changes in our range because our range has been really towards our core customers and the younger audience will have different um, sort, the, the dif a different range will have different sort of appeal. The relevance. So really tapping into that day-to-day -day culture. Some of the speakers earlier this morning talked about the wealth of data and carrying, looking at the data, but the context is very important as well. And that's what keeps customers engaged. So that's, that's one of the goals that we had. The value. So really unpack great value gift and really thinking about that value for money barriers that I talked about and really thinking the perception because value for money is not the same to all of us. So it's really important to understand that and see how we can reflect that throughout our marketing. And then finally, the consideration. So really the execution. Post-COVID and, you know, it's been, it's been like that for quite a few years. Um, 
you can't just um, sell. It's really important to showcase what is the personality of the brand, what are their values, and why, why there is that sort of special connection. So it was very important as we rebrand it to sort of showcase that and make sure that we didn't lost ourselves and lose our super fans, but also engage with, uh, with uh, uh, new audiences. And so in September 2022, we had to delay a little bit our relaunch because it fell around the same time as the Queen's passing. Uh, obviously, always, always uh, lots of ups and downs in the last few years since COVID, uh, as you all know. Um, so the gift tag became a knot and the blue became purple. Um, but, you know, we were very aware of some of the challenges that we had, especially with our super fans. So, like I said earlier, some of our, uh, some of our customers have been with us for decades. And, you know, the look and feel and how we came across changed significantly. And the key risk for us was to alienate those super fans and lose them. So, it was, so that was an additional element that we really kept, uh, we kept our eyes on. And so... As part of the rebrand, we, create, we unpacked our brand platform. So this was the sort of one pager that was circulated across the entire business and also with our partners around what is the brand today? What do we want to do? And we want to make more moments of joy. And how do we do that? So I know on the high street, we're home of the makers. And I think over the years, we've probably come across more as a retailer than a marketplace. And it was very important for us to try to put more at the forefront of everything that we do, our makers, because we would be nothing without them. Wherever you want to give, we're here. And this is really around the bro broadening the appeal. And as you broaden to a younger audience, you have to think platform differentiation and diversification of the channels that you're picking. Giving that makes moments of memories. So it's really tapping outside of this top four, trying to increase the frequency beyond just the birthday and the big four. And then finally, bring moments of joy to the sender and the recipient. So really becoming that go-to gifting destination. And so that's a little bit of what it looked like uh, when it all started. It has evolved, um, but um, just to sort of summarize a little bit um, how we've changed. So you can see the colors are very vibrant. So we've got a brand new color palette. Our tone of voice has changed, very playful now. And the expression and what we try to communicate through our photography changed significantly. There was more excitement, more joy. And we tried to also make sure that we, showca we were showcasing the diversity and the inclusion that we have as a brand with our partners and with our employees as well. The products changed as well. Um, so we introduced new products that were more appealing to um, the younger audience. So fast forward a quarter after the launch of the brand. Um, so as a brand we've had uh, for forever long, I think probably over 10 years now, maybe 15, uh, a brand tracker which we're running every quarter. So this is re really what uh, keeps us in line with what is happening and how the brand is perceived throughout the UK. So we are using a brand tracking partner uh, and we usually run, uh, sort of run uh, a, a certain amount of questions. Those questions will be changing. They are going out to those audiences. And the brand tracker, we, we're going out to about 2,000 customers. They're essentially representing the UK market. So the first quarter, what was important was actually for people to notice that we've changed. As much as I shown the logo, etc., and the colors, there was a massive change. And to all the employees, there was a massive change, and to all of our partners. But it was important to really show that. And from the results of the brand tracker, we saw that overall twice as many were more likely to buy than being put off. And we had stronger positive outcome with the younger audiences, which was great, because that's what we wanted. Yet there was a few hicks up. And those were the things that we were going to focus on and how we were going to evolve the brand. We wanted to drive consideration, and there were some elements that just didn't, didn't sort of work. We had some challenges in terms of how people perceive the, the, the diverse range and the uniqueness of uh, our items. But they also looked at um, how the brand was perceived actually as less joyful, less uplifting. So it was really important for us to think about the iteration and what's going to be the 2.0 uh, version of the brand. So we made some iteration, and I think some of the reflection that we had was that the range of emotion that we had was a little bit 
same everywhere. So we were thinking about what are the different types of emotions that we will have throughout the gifting journey. So that's when we added more of the kids and new baby categories, when we added uh, uh, anniversaries, weddings, etc. Showing the range was really important as well. And I think, you know, when you do a, re when you do a rebrand, there is a lot of money that in is invested. And then when you're changing campaigns, there is also a lot that is invested in the photography. So it was very important for us to really think creatively around how we can reuse the photography, diversify, yet showcase range. So we went with more of a collage approach, uh, trying to really uh, uh, showcase all of those moments. And then portraying the diversity again. So we lost out a little bit on the personalization, but also on uh, the, the baby and child, the older generation. So we really tried to introduce that. And then again, carried on on experimenting and testing. And so fast forward to the following quarter, uh, all of, the, all of the areas that we wanted to improve on has improved. Some more than the others, and we quite yet to have reached our target, but the grand, grand consideration and the recognition for unique items actually were the two that increased significantly. And that's really around how we've been rethinking about how we show more product in situ, how we diversify further our models and our photography. I'm coming to my last slide now. Uh, but I think that the few learnings that I want you to, you to take away, um, there, is a, there is a process, there is a lot of data, there is a lot of structure, but there is also the culture within the business that is actually really important. And I think that's something that, you know, we're still on that journey and we're still working with all the employees across the business. But I think knowing your customer and working across teams is very important. So investing in the data, but also the context of it all. So the UX research and doing those interviews and really talking to real life customers was really important and not just looking at the data. Focus on what you can control. I mean, like I said, we had the Queen's passing, then we had the postal strikes, then we have lots of bank holidays. I mean, we've been, so many things have been thrown at us. And it's really important to remain calm and just focus on what it is that you can control and not just look at necessarily all that is happening that is out of your control. Be bold, because if you want big changes, that won't happen if you're not being bold. Yet, I guess the caveat I put to that is the fact that you need to be speedy, not perfect, and test and learn. If you think that things are not working, that's fine. You need to accept that you're going to be able to fail, but it's about what you do after that and how do you make the changes. And I think that's one of the things, like I said at the beginning, we're still on our journey, but we are being bold and speedy, not perfect, but still remain focused on what is our true customer value proposition. And I think above all is really the power of the teams. Uh, you know, one of our biggest value not on the high street is about championing team spirits. And about the past 12 to 18 months, we really tried to push the team to work in matrix ways. So creating smaller teams that are from multiple departments and not just trying to have one department that just takes, the, takes full control over everything. And I think that's really some of the things that have really changed the culture, but has also helped really improve uh, everything that we've done so far. Thank you.